Hi there, welcome to your second lecture for week five of uh, Contemporary Art. Again, <clears throat> more stuff about performance and the emergence of performance as a really important genre in the 1960s. As I said last time, the roots of this kind of art go farther back, and you can see it in Yves Klein or in Piero Manzoni or in the Gutage group, or even some of the um, collaborative stuff that Jasper Johns is doing and Robert Rauschenberg uh, earlier on with guys like John Cage, but it becomes a really important medium in the 1960s and <clears throat> goes in a couple of different directions. So today I'm just going to show you really a couple more artists, um, primarily Chris Burden and Joseph Boyce, but I just want to kind of give you some sense of where performance art goes once it starts to really take hold in the 60s. One way that it goes, and I mentioned last time that performance is also, and the emergence of like fluxes, for example, is also tied to the larger context of the 1960s where you have this youth culture emerging and a culture that wants to reject the so-called establishment and question all received traditions and values. The culture that produces on one end things like Woodstock, you know, the three-day rock festival in the mud that was supposed to be so sort of open and free and non-bourgeois, and then on the other end, much more sort of political activism. Quite famously, by the late 1960s, youth had become so political that, and that there were even, you know, violent groups that had emerged in the 1960s. And there is a blending or a bleeding over between some of the more kind of radical what are called interventions and protests that were staged by some of these more radical student groups uh, and pure performance art and probably the exemplar of that is this man named Abby Hoffman who was a leader of the, uh, the Weathermen which was a, a underground sort of student group they were responsible for planning to disrupt the uh, um, Democratic National Convention in 1968 in Chicago. You may have run into this in a history class at some point. Um, but Abby Hoffman was also generally a kind of um, radical leader. He was a leader of protests against capitalism in general, uh, the Vietnam War. Um, in 1967, Hoffman did a basically a happening that was also politically motivated at the New York Stock Exchange in uh, August of 67. He and his crew were in the visitors gallery at the Stock Exchange, which at that time was actually open to the trading floor. And so you could, you know, go to the visitors gallery and stand there and watch traders on the floor um, as they were at work. And Hoffman and his friends took a bunch of fake photocopied dollar bills and started throwing them over the balcony onto the trading floor, which actually, and this was their happening, it was their intervention, it was their performance piece slash um, protest. What happened was the traders stopped doing what they were doing and started grabbing after these dollar bills, sort of at a very, you know, almost ridiculous level, illustrating the idea that, oh, these guys are money-grubbing pigs or what have you, right? So um, they were... <laughs> so concerned with grabbing dollar bills that turned out to be fake that they stopped actually doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, Hoffman claimed that he was just pointing out that if, metaphorically what they were doing already before they started grabbing for the dollar bills was essentially the same thing. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange expelled him, he got in trouble, and uh, later they closed in the gallery so that something like that couldn't happen again. So in 1968, the next year, Hoffman was one of the activists who was incited for uh, and accused of inciting riots at the uh, Democratic National Convention. Later that year, he was arrested for wearing a shirt like the one you see him wearing in these pictures of uh, a shirt made out of an American flag. Uh, and then in 1970, he was one of the organizers of the People's Flag Show which you can see a couple of artifacts from the People's Flag Show here. So the flag being used on a variety of objects. A show that was deliberately meant to be provocative. This became a very hot button ish issue in the 1960s. You had protesters who would burn the flag. You had flags being used in um, all sorts of non-traditional ways. So not just being flown, but being turned into articles of clothing. Uh, being worn as patches on your jeans, you know, all, and this was at a point when 
of course, the ge generation who were parents of this group of young people who were doing this kind of stuff were the people who had fought World War II, and they had a very different attitude toward the flag. And so there was a real tug of war over this symbol and how you could use it and how you should never use it. And uh, people were arrested for doing things like wearing a flag shirt at that point in time. It continues, of course, to be a bit of a touch and go or touchy th subject. What do you do with the flag? But I think, you know, we're a little less likely to be as shocked by something like the flag shirt that he's wearing. The um, some of the other objects maybe still would be upsetting to people that you can see in this image. Let's see, and so I just wanted to show you, I mean, this is Abby Hoffman, who's basically a political activist, but he also is using the idea of the happening or performance art as a way of doing political protest as well. And I just have a couple of quotes from Abby Hoffman that will give you a sense of his um, take on things. He says, avoid all needle drugs. The only dope worth shooting is Richard Nixon. He actually, this is a quote from a book called Steal This Book. And the Steal This Book was a, a book that um, he kind of wrote that was encouraging people to do everyday acts of um, political intervention or happenings. And he says, on the popularity of Steal This Book, which became a bestseller, it's embarrassing when you try to overthrow the government and you wind up on the bestsellers list. He also said, a modern revolutionary group heads for the television station. And... I believe in compulsory cannibalism. If people were forced to eat what they killed, there would be no more wars. And you measure a democracy by the freedom it gives its dissidents, not by the freedom it gives its assimilated conformists. So anyway, I mean, I bring him in. He's more of a political guy than maybe a traditional artist, but also, again, really delving into the world of performance art and the, the way that performance art allows you to challenge and question um, all sorts of received wisdom. Okay, so that's Abby Hoffman in a nutshell. The next artist that we have to look at, and there's a piece I want you to read this week written by Peter Sheldahl, who's the um, art critic for The New Yorker. It's linked from Blackboard this week, uh, a piece that's sort of Sheldahl's ruminations on Chris Burden. Chris Burden emerged as a performance artist with this piece, this is his master's thesis piece from the University of California at Irvine. He actually arranged to have himself locked into one of these lockers for a um, period of five days. It was a two by three by three foot locker. There was a five gallon jug of water in the locker above him and an empty five gallon container in the locker below. And he stayed in there for five days and um, that was his that was his thesis piece. Okay, this is what makes him break through into the uh, art world is this performance, which seems to be a rather masochistic or sadomasochistic performance. One of the things he liked about the piece, he said, was that he was trapped in there or he was in there twenty four seven for those five days. People would come and talk to him and treated him a little bit like um, a confessional, I guess, you know, so students from campus would come there and say stuff to him during the day and during the night, during the time that he was there. I think as you read the Sheldahl article, you see he raises all sorts of questions about what's going on with these early performance pieces by Chris Burden. Burden continues to work as an artist. He has abandoned in, the, in recent years this kind of uh, um, dangerous performance, but it raises all kinds of questions about the boundaries of art and when something goes from being a piece of art to maybe possibly um, criminal. For example, and I've got some film of this and audio of this on the web that you should listen to this week. This is Chris Burden's piece called Shoot from 19 November 71. It's documented in some Super 8 footage and some audio recordings. Chris Burden is the guy in the t-shirt at the left and that's a friend of his who has the rifle there on the right. Burden um, had his friend shoot him in the arm with a rifle. Now, in the 1960s and late 1960s, there had been a devastating string of political assassinations that had happened in 68 and 69. 
there had been, of course, there was constant talk about the Vietnam War going on. And so he's bringing all of that into the gallery. Um, this is the... And so it seems to be a work a little bit about violence. He had his friend, it's a it's a small caliber rifle, so he had a flesh wound, basically grazed him in the arm, and um, then he was taken to the hospital, and that was the whole performance. It raises questions, obviously, about should a gallery let something like this happen? Who's liable if he were to get shot even voluntarily and be severely injured? Um... What are you as a viewer supposed to do if you're in this gallery? Are you supposed to watch this happen? It also seems to be in some ways commentary, right, about the state of American society and the likelihood of being shot on the street, things like that. And so there's Chris after being shot in the arm. You can see he's got this bullet wound there. He looks a little bit uncomfortable. Um, there are some people who have said that he wasn't really expecting to actually get shot that he thought his friend was going to miss him, but I don't know if that's really true. Certainly that look on his face looks a little bit surprised. Uh, okay, so this is what start. So between that and the five-day locker piece, Burden starts to come to real national attention among the art world. Here in 1974, he does another piece that um, really exemplifies this early kind of uh, cruel... Or, sadis or sadistic or masochistic uh, work that, that Burden is so known for. Here, in Transfixed, he had a friend take large nails and nail him in a crucifix position to the back of a Volkswagen. And there you can see him. Uh, and the Volkswagen was then backed out of a garage, and he... Um, basically stayed there for about 20 minutes and then they took him down and took him to the hospital. Now, he did, let's see, oh, Volkswagen was chosen because it was the car of the people and Burden wanted his crucifixion to liberate not just himself, he said, but everyone. He saved the um, nails that were used to nail him to the Volkswagen and then this was displayed, as were other pieces of the performances that he did that were similar to this, uh, were displayed in a show of so-called relics. And that's the, the relics. And so you can see where he's got a kind of quasi-religious thing going on in these early pieces, a relic from Transfixed. He did a show, or a piece called I Became a Secret Hippie, where he laid down on the ground, had a friend nail furniture upholstery tacks, into his sternum, um, basically in a, a star-shaped sort of configuration on his sternum, and then Burden sat in a chair and um, had his head shaved and dressed in his suit so that he looked like an establishment figure, and then you would not know that he had this kind of hippie body modification going on unless you looked under the shirt, right? So... Um, then that, of course, the, the studs from that were saved and then used as relics in this other show. He also did, let's see, in 1972, a piece called Dead Man, where he covered himself with a tarp lying in the middle of the road, flanked by two flares. The flares would eventually burn out, increasing the risk of him being run over by a car, with the idea that you are, as the um, viewer of this piece, then you have to struggle with where you are supposed to be, what you are supposed to be doing, what your responsibility is in this sort of performance environment. Now, you do not have to like Chris Burden or love him, but between this and reading about him in that Sheldahl article, I want you to get some sense of where this rather radical style of performance is coming from. Let's see, White Light, White Heat. In February of 75, he um, spent the whole time in the gallery on the platform in the corner without eating and was not seen or heard from the entire time he was there. So a fairly long period of time going without food up in a corner of the gallery. And as Sheldell talks about, kind of opening up the door for the question about, um, you know, when 
is something a piece of art and when do you have a duty to intervene? Is there such a thing as the kind of sacred nature of the gallery that we should never interrupt? If an object is an object, we're not supposed to touch it, right? We're not supposed to mess with it. We're not supposed to interfere. But then when, when you've got somebody who's involved in human suffering, how do you uh, reconcile those two things? <coughs> the last piece that he did that was a piece like this was in 1975, and Sheldahl describes this pretty well, doomed in um, Chicago, where he laid down under a leaning piece of glass for 48 hours. And during that time, of course, he didn't get up, he didn't speak, he didn't move, he soiled himself, he was um, getting dehydrated. Then a gallery attendant couldn't take it anymore and left him a glass of water. And when, at that moment, that the gallery attendant decided to break the kind of inviolable space of the gallery and the art object and the performance piece, um, that's when Burden ended the piece, smashed the clock, and had a glass of water. Uh, and Sheldahl talks a lot about this, and I want you to kind of think about it this week when we're looking at performance art, you know, and this is something that will continue to be an issue. We'll see two years ago there was actually a guy down in um, South America who took a dog off the street and put it in a gallery. It was a street dog that was starving, and he put it in a gallery and essentially let the, um, let the uh, dog slowly starved to death and so that became a big controversy with questions about you know when is art art and when is it just something that's criminal behavior <laughs>